I'm, I'm always down to talk Cobra. Yeah. Co- so, yeah. I feel like he, like, there's a chance that Trump thinks it's real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, a lot no, of it yeah. is, like, they bang the swords. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's good. <laughs> right. like, yeah. Uh, we like, uh, the, the, the gang in it is, like, it's run by a Satanist and his mother or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're like, are you ready to die? Pig. Like the way he says pig over and over again. That was the, that like, I love that era of movies where like a gang, like every bad person in the world was Satanist. Like no one was after really profit or anything like that. Like cornering the drug market. They're just like, I like being bad. <laughs> it's just, like not at all supernatural. There's a lot of like wet interiors in that too. As <laughs> yeah, I recall, like a lot of the like, axe gang. They're like, yeah. they're, they're, they're like clanging the axes together. And like the base, this is also the era That's where just like basic satanic where, where, where every, they're... every street gang had to have like a big clubhouse. But in Cobra, theirs was like inexplicably like a still working foundry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's one little line from that that was like, before memes existed, this was just something that my high school friends I understood was funny, which is like his Cobra's getting dragged for for being too real and like fighting criminals too well. And one of them says, you got a real attitude problem, Cobra. And his comeback to that is to say, I know, but it's just a little one. <laughs> and it's not an own. It's not a comeback. It's just like the thing that he says before he leaves. And I remember watching it in a friend's basement, and we all knew somehow to just rewind that moment, just to be like, let's really get a sense of of why this is happening and and what it might be supposed to mean. We didn't talk about it. We never really talked about it. We just kept saying it back and forth to each other for the remainder of our time in high school. Well, it's a good one. Cobra is an absolute classic. Um. All right. Let's um. Let's get us started. Um, we're joined here. It's a, it's a rare episode with uh, just me and Felix, but yeah. luckily we have our we, good friend. Matt Chrisman has been fired. <laughs> we After an internal affairs investigation on Matt Chrisman for several infractions, uh, we have, we've terminated his contract. We are moving forward. Uh, yes. Um, we've, put, we've put Matt Chrisman on, on waivers. Uh, Virgil, Texas has still not returned from Germany. In fact, no. he's, we've lost contact with him entirely. Yeah, he's, gone, <laughs> he's gone native. <laughs> He's yeah. gone. He's gone native. He. We are told that he has both dreadlocks and a ponytail now. <laughs> the last transmission we got from him was several weeks ago, and it just said uh, "der funk boom boom," <laughs> yeah. and uh, like that's the last transmission. But like we are, we are going to mount uh, a mission, like similar to Heart of Darkness, yeah. to travel into <laughs> yes. in, my, into my, the depths of the most depraved um, sex clubs in Berlin to find him. My human has uh, indicated to me that Virgil is in contact to start a franchise of restaurants called Sexy Burger. <laughs> no, but uh, luckily we the have... it being like Deer Hunter where you confront him and it's just at a shop that only sells sweatsuits <laughs> and you have to like try to get through to him but he's gone. Like he's just... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, but l- luckily we've got uh, our, our friend David Roth uh, sitting in today and like uh, obviously um, uh, we would like to, uh, to, to get your perspective, David, on... Um, just how, uh, yeah, private equity vampires continue to um, destroy uh, everything that is, I don't know, good or even mildly enjoyable in our culture and society. Because you've certainly been on the front lines of that recently. Yeah. But um, before that, um, I was just wondering, because, you know, uh, Felix says this, this has now been like, this is a, this is a, something that was like a major cultural institution that's been sort of a cult thing that has now been absorbed into the Felix headcanon with... Um, uh, surprising and impressive results. So I was actually just going to start off by asking you, David, are you familiar with, or have you ever seen the the animated uh, television program Neon Genesis Evangelion? I've seen the words on Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> like the best minds of my generation talking Neon Genesis Evangelion or Gellion. I, I have no idea what it is. I'm grown, man. I don't know that shit. <laughs> like, what is, is it? Uh, Evangelion. Okay. It mean it, literal translation is uh, the the uh, script the testament of the new century, I think. Sounds Could be cool. scripture, I forget. But um, no, this is this is a grown ass adult show. Yeah, this is not for babies. David. Yeah, no, this isn't baby shit. Yes, is it about Max? Sort of, <laughs> but it's about a lot more. Because no. could you like try to explain to David what the show is about or what happens on All it? All right, it's very simple. A um, it sounds it sounds really simple based on uh, yeah. what you've said so far. An amoral an amoral widower scientist uh, who heads a, a giant deep state project in the aftermath 
of an event called the Second Impact operates giant mechs that fight otherworldly creatures, monsters called angels. Jendo Ikari is reunited with his son Shinji Ikari, who is the only one who can pilot the robot Ava Unit 01. I'm following you so far. <laughs> Shinji, Shinji um, is the only one who can do it, but he has been sp- he spent his entire life running away. He's, a, he's like seen as like a timid boy, just does whatever he's told, goes to school, goes to school in Tokyo 3. He's got all the problems you have going to school as a 14-year-old, but he's got he's to get in that mech. He's got to fucking fight those angels. But we find out, you know, we find out about the death of his mother, find out about the true nature of the mechs, the Avas, why the second impact happened, the, the, the history behind the second impact, you learn a lot about the meaning of our lives through our connections to others, rising to the occasion, the choice to the the choice of self sacrifice, the nature of motherhood, fatherhood. Masato is so hot. <laughs> so yeah, is- it's basically about a um uh, a scared little boy who has to get inside. It's like they're 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 giant robots, but they're actually also like living creatures. Yeah, they're yeah, sort yeah. of like cyborgs. Well, I don't want to spoil. Yeah, I'm trying okay. to do this without spoiling too much about like the big revelation about Ray and uh, really Ava Unit you know, One. But this is like just in, and, for my old person, uh, just ease of understanding where we're going here. People, you really like this. Like this is this, like, oh, this is right, cool. This owns. This is so fucking good. All right, no, this I can is never ab- tell amazing. at some point when something achieves this level of ubiquity where I'm sort of like, I mean, I know like it's not snakes on a plane or whatever. Right. Like I can tell like at the, the outer boundary of it. So no, this, this is, is like a like a cult like Japanese like like anime series that's like had a very long half life because I think it was like made in like the 80s or something like that. Like, uh, early mid 90s. Mid 90s. Okay, yeah. so it's had, it's been around for a while. Why is it having this moment? Because Netflix has finally put the entire series yeah. on its you know streaming platform. So now it's like before that it was like you know you had to pass around like you know ancient VHS copies or like bit torrented or something, um, but now it's available for everyone to see. And I think it says, you know, a lot about the world we live in today. No, 100%. I mean, who is Shinji Ikari but Donald Trump? And getting in the Ava is becoming president. <laughs> and his father, Gendo Ikari, great brain. He gave great brain. <laughs> I was going to say, I think the, the Ava Unit 1 for our current moment is, of course, um, Big Structural Bailey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you guys familiar with Big Structural yeah, Bailey? It's, yeah, it's very I've similar. Never to- clicked play on the video, but just the the like Wicker Man still <laughs> is like yeah, yeah. the starting image is so unsettling that I never will. Yeah, um, they, every year they have to send a wonk who's never earned a lanyard <laughs> into Big Wicker Bailey. Uh, Big Structural Bailey is, is the closest thing to like the American version of an Evangelion, an a- AV Unit yeah. One, Two, or Three, or even Zero. Uh, it, it's gigantic. I mean, it's like like it's a it's like a living thing, sort of, but it's also deeply monstrous and, and terrifying. Oh, Liz Warren's mom was killed in the construction of Big Structural Bailey, <laughs> and so she could never truly determine her genetic True. heritage. Yeah, yeah, legacy, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, one hundred percent. And you know, Elizabeth Warren running towards it, and then like the people chanting, "Big Structural Bailey, Big Structural Bailey, Liz, get in the robot." Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is like, yes, you must pilot the Ava. Yeah, and someone has to pilot Big Structural Bailey <laughs> because, like, we need to fuse Elizabeth Warren's intelligence with its like sort of giant animalistic cyborg body. But if her sit like th- there is going to be a time where she gets in Big Structural Bailey. And they'll be like, oh my God, we've never seen sync rates with big structural Bailey <laughs> at 400%. But they're like, then it starts moving on its own and it starts like doing the shoot dance. <laughs> and, and, and they're, and they're like, what, what is big structural Bailey? And so Pete Buttigieg also pilots a giant inflatable dog, but he's like, he's like, Asuka Langley. Yeah, he's Asuka. Asuka, yeah, Asuka, yeah. He's yeah. like, I'm the best. The left is pompous. I can unite this country. I was born to pilot an inflatable dog. <laughs> and 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 Liz, she's he's like, stupid Liz, idiot Liz, and idiot Bernie think they're the best. I'm really the best. I'm the only one who can share access to health care for all Americans. <laughs> no, uh, but yeah, just like imagine imagine big structural Bailey just like stomping through 
a city. Yeah. But like, but, but like protecting us. Right. Protecting and, us against something uh, terrifying. And angels are the bad form of capitalism. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me what actually happens in the big structural Bailey video? To okay. So, um, okay. It? So it's, it's, Elizabeth Warren has a dog named Bailey. This I, I, yeah, right, which we'll is like as her. Chris has pointed out, she got probably two weeks before she declared her run for presidency. <laughs> just, just months, yeah. yeah, I can't wait till we get corrected on this by like just like one of those people who has his entire sentence as a display name, not me. Minor sentence fragments. <laughs> uh, and who's like, uh, actually, here's an interview with Liz Warren about Bailey in 2013 in the Hill. Try next time. <laughs> Like, so, cool, thanks, man. Uh, regardless of the uh, you know the providence of, uh, of of Big Bailey, it's you know it's like this it's, it's a it's a golden lab, right? I mean, she, let's be honest, she got the most white people who dog imagine. <laughs> and so, and somehow yeah. like went to had multiple appointments with a breeder about it. One hundred percent. I know this because you know this is how I get dogs, and after a week, I get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're not good after that. So for for some reason, uh, her campaign has decided to, you know, make Bailey, I guess, kind of a mascot. And again, I have watched the video, but I am still as perplexed as you are. David. Yeah, it's so there's like, like it's, there's a Gollum version of it. it, it they, they created, like, you know, it's sort of similar to Scabby the Rat, but not yeah, grotesque. Yeah, all right, it's yeah. like, and then that it's like this giant inflatable animal, um, and it's like a, a, a giant golden lab. Oh, wait, right? the campaign did this. Yes, shit. the campaign I did. I thought she, like discovered a piece of pop art during her travels through <laughs> Iowa. They, I don't even really know who created it. I mean, it, it, it was, it, it's pretty fucked up. Boyd Rice actually <laughs> made it. <laughs> no, the, the, no, the big Bailey just appeared. It crashed into Antarctica and that's what is known as the second, <laughs> it's, it's known as the second impact. Yeah. And, you know, uh, rendered much of uh, the, the surface of the planet of the earth. It, it was an extinction level event and yeah. we're now living in the, in the post big structure. Right. We're, we're, we're in all, DC three. Yeah. Um, yeah, in in, in the Capitol three, and like uh, the 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 Senate and White House, it rises out of the ground because it's also like an underground city as well. Don't worry too much about that. Dude. Yeah, all right, it's fine. But um, yeah. uh, so in the in 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 this video, this found footage, <laughs> uh, it's Elizabeth Warren running towards a, a it's sort of like uh, almost like a statue of Baal or, or Mala. Yeah, yeah. It's arms this, arms outstretched. Yeah, exactly. In, in the again, I'm just going off the still, but there's a lot. Going and it's, on it's a giant inflatable version of her dog, Big Bailey. And then she's she's running towards it, sort of waving her arms, doing the Liz Warren, like, I'm excited kind of thing. Yeah. Um, she's running towards this giant dog. And then, like, her, you can hear her acolytes in the background start chanting, Big Structural Bailey. Big Structural Bailey, which is, you know, a very clever you know, mashup of big structural change yeah, and, and, and the of dog. Of course, the dog's the, name, the Bailey. Bailey. The yeah, Bailey. right, right. Yeah. That part I get, yeah. And uh, currently, um, through memes, um, Elizabeth Warren's, you know, comms team are attempting to source which child would be best to put inside big structural <laughs> yeah. Bailey and, and control it. Yeah, no, yeah, they, they're operating entire Wong... It seems like a normal Wong school, but it's actually like... <laughs> All the second children who will pilot the Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> Seems okay. like a normal wonk school is just a delightful yeah. phrase on well, its own. No, you, I mean, you think it's a normal wonk school? You, you like know, the one, you, like you, the kind you walk right, by every right. day. Right. You, you, you're doing, you're doing stats. You're like uh, doing Freakonomics or whatever. Yeah, I was uh, gonna say like means you, testing. Yeah, you have fun by like doing escape rooms or some bullshit. <laughs> but really, you know, there's an entire project behind this. Okay, who's Ray Ayanami in this? Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's, she's like, doesn't care if she lives or dies. Yeah. Like, completely just no affect. She's been, you know, injured in workout yeah. accidents. In the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Pete Asuka. Mm -hmm. um, I'd actually say Bernie Sanders is Jendo Ikari because he, you know, wants to play God by giving everyone health care. Mm -hmm. The you human know, instrumentality yeah, project. He wants to escape death. Not good. Um, <laughs> he like always just like misogynistically ensnares women in, in his plots. You put like, them the inside squat. giant dogs. No, not just that. Like how Ritsuko represents the squad. <laughs> like how he used her. Uh, yeah, he's well. I'm, similar I'm, glasses to Gendo. When he yeah mm -hmm. no okay yeah he's right. Gendo Ikari. All right, I think I, I think I, I think I've done my task 
of yeah, like giving giving our listeners the kind of brain poisoning that they that they need <laughs> they and need that they this, crave yeah. to have. That you, they, yeah, we've now done the synthesis of Big Structural Bailey and Neon Genesis Evangelion. So just think about that, you know, from now on. It's a like holidays are coming up. You guys are going back to Thanksgiving. You know, you have a big problem where you know your mom is a Marxist Leninist, but your dad is like a committed member of ISO or some shit. And you guys always have arguments because you're a Demstock cuck. And you guys just, you always fight at Thanksgiving. But instead of like the usual stuff you guys fight about Thanksgiving, we want you to come home talking about this crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. I, oh, God. I forgot the last and actually I think most interesting detail of the big structural valley found footage is that for some reason the dog, the giant dog, has two pennies on its collar. And I still haven't figured that out. It's change, I guess. Like, it's oh. change. But it's also like, you know, here's my two cents. Oh, yeah. It's the two cent wealth tax. It's a, okay, uh, so it refers to a two cent wealth tax. As long as it can be mistaken for some sort of occult signifier, it's good <laughs> politics. Yeah, yeah. Can't beat that. I, I, I did some digging and found the, the war and camp relevance of the two cent wealth tax, but I'm sure you will, other people, immediately assumed that it is the pennies that it leaves on its victim's eyes after it assassinates it. <laughs> you can't see two pennies on something and not think okay, about well, that, okay. right? You know how, like, when the angels blow up, like, oftentimes it, like, it creates, like, an explosion in the shape of a crucifix? Yes, When yes. Big Structural Bailey defeats the angels with the tech knife, like, it, it blows in the shape of two cents. Because they're, they're angels of bad capitalism. There we go. All right, <laughs> well, whew. Okay, we we've, we've, we've put that to bed. Terrific. All right. We've put that to bed. All right. Um, uh, but I, I think maybe we should talk to David about something that he does know yeah, about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to, to keep going. I'm, I feel like we, I've got a lot I, to I, learn about this show. I, I think Felix and I could we could probably extend this riff for another hour or so. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, that's being conservative. <laughs> yeah, I could be here all day. But um, I, I think maybe there's a smaller portion of our audience that would actually like to uh, talk, hear your thoughts about um, you know Deadspin. Or what is dead spin may never die? Oh, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that referring to the, the thing that's still at that URL as dead spin is uh, imprecise yeah. and insufficient. But yeah, there's uh, everyone in dead spin is, uh, you know, everyone that worked there is no longer working there. Uh, so uh, wherever we go, that's where it is now. Yeah. Uh, which is, it sounds like powerful, but at the same time, I'm unemployed. <laughs> so it kind of, it cuts both ways. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty bad, man. It sucked. Uh, David, no, when you when you first walked in, I said I, uh, you know, you were running a little bit late, and I said I felt like uh, Eric Roberts in uh, <laughs> the Pope of Greenwich Village when he gets Mickey Rourke fired, and then just goes, "What's the matter? You don't got a job to go to no more." <laughs> yeah, that but was... you know, <clears throat> you know, we should be clear of this. Like, uh, uh, you know, like obviously uh, we're friends with you. We're all big fans of the site, but uh, as far as like the the rank scale of like you know injustices in the world that we've talked about on this show, I don't want to you know play it too much up, but like it does suck and it is indicative of like a much yeah. larger problem of like what's going on and also a personal connection to us because like you know Deadspin really gave Felix his start before yeah, like yeah, anything yeah. happened on the show and then like also published uh, Brendan James's uh, brilliant uh, piece about national security psychopath uh, Robert Caruso. Yeah, yeah, Deadspin was, I mean. That's really how I remember it. They just took a lot of chances on both like people and rating that like I don't legitimately think would have found a home anywhere else. Certainly, the stuff that you've run with us was never like. I mean, it was all quite good, but it was also like very much more in the Felix lane than in like the sports lane. Like yeah, the Rich you, Piana thing. Like it being like huge and taking Winstrol is not a sport. No, you know, no. Like, no. <laughs> and he wasn't even like you can argue you know competitive bodybuilding is a sport. He wasn't even like in competition right, anymore. That's the yeah, he was just kind of a, a YouTube man. Yeah, like Marchman pretty much say he's the only one of the only people in like uh, when he worked there is like one of the only people in a job like that who told me what Will tells me every week, which is like give brain damage to our audience. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that was before I showed any ability to like get people to click on something or generate money. He's just like everyone at Deadspin just like they wanted to do things they believed in constantly and the amazing thing was it worked like it was an incredibly successful place well we can get into like actually the the actual metrics of like why it was successful and why the people who took it over have you know for whatever reason uh through business business genius mindset yeah. have uh, completely run it into the fucking I, ground i love that like now that this guy who spent 
his entire life just like you know borrowing money to just strip places their assets like he has to run the block now <laughs> yeah this fucking moron but um why don't, why don't we start like i guess like david what like, start like wherever you want to in this story i mean you were inside it like like narrate for us if you will like what happened at deadspin i guess over the last like five four five six months and like even just the last week yeah so pegging this to it's like hard to because you can do a version of this that goes back to previous ownership and in folds like peter Thiel and the sort of like expanded hell world cinematic universe but i don't think <laughs> that like broadly speaking like so we were sold to a private equity concern called great hill partners uh last spring <laughs> one tree hill uh, yeah media properties <laughs> really, which by the way i didn't realize until just uh, all this shit went down that it's based out of Boston. Yeah. So that, I honestly, every, that was the final piece that clicked into it. Right. It does sort of start to, all of it is like, it was like the Kobayashi porcelain at the end of the <laughs> <Right. laughs> Yeah. This was, uh, so yes, they put this Boston, uh, private equity concern, uh, bought Deadspin and the other GMG websites at a discount. A guy, uh, who had run Forbes.com back when it was like the skankiest content mill that they were putting up like thousands of posts a day, like 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, he put up 10% and installed himself as CEO. And this was the real problem. The reputation that, that Great Hill had, nobody in media wants to get bought by a private equity concern because, uh, well, for obvious reasons, but like the way that they've done newspapers in the past, a couple of really big ones. Like they destroy them, and it's then like, when it's, it's like done, the, they it's like the out. bust out in Goodfellas. It, it, exactly yeah, like, is that. It, like basically, the model is to <clears> make <throat> things shittier and cheaper faster than advertisers can leave, and that's that margin is your profit, and also the fact that you're paying yourself this management fee for doing the hard work of, you know, what they did in like Denver, which is basically firing two thirds of the staff of the Denver Post. So that is is a bad way to go. And that was our fear in this case was that, you know, they could do something like that. And to a certain extent, uh, the CEO, his name's Jim Spanfeller, has done that. But we're also in like this weird sort of like avant-garde business realm where if it was a sort of thing where like if we were caught in the gears of someone trying to extract maximum profit from our website and, you know, make us do stuff we didn't want to do. I think everybody was prepared to eat a certain amount of shit just because, like, it's a job, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what you do. And at some point, it became clear that making money was maybe not the main concern of the CEO. And at that point, it's real difficult to know what to do because the usual levers that you can push or pull in an employer-employee relationship don't do anything. Nothing is connected to anything else. That this... First, getting rid of Splinter, which he did. Uh, that was like a couple, just a couple weeks ago. I know. This is yeah. what's fucking amazing yeah. about it. I was Splinter like, of course, was, in late 2015 <sighs> when he got rid of Splinter. And like, like, Splinter was like uh, ostensibly like the politics site. Yeah. That was like the most one that was like the like Gawker Mark II kind yeah. of, but like specifically about politics. And, you know, like they always had kind of, you know, an uneasy, that was always tenuous. And then like, they just shut. They shuttered Splinter. Yeah, like a, a lot weeks of people like, left Splinter around the time. So there was a we were, there was a buyouts, and then like yeah. you know through the through the GMG union, they were able to negotiate um a like like a severance. Right, when they, that you when can speak on Splinter as, yeah, with yeah. more knowledge than me, but yeah, um yeah, like so like because of the I mean it was like, again like you see like once a private equity takes over, it's sort of like the writings on the wall. Yeah, some people took buyouts, and the ones who stuck around, thanks to the union, were able to negotiate like a severance, which is basically like the I mean. As far as you need, like this was like the concession that mattered. Like it wasn't going to save their jobs, but yeah. like they were able to like have it. So like when they got the axe, it wasn't like completely like a complete. They weren't just like it, like some of the other places like Mike or whatever who were just like right. You know, they don't exist stuff in a anymore. box, and like then you get nothing. Yeah, like, yeah. Like in this case, it was. I mean, this is where the union does the best possible work. Is like it's just mitigating the the lower lows of this whole thing. The challenge with all of this, though, is that like there's a way that union and management have interacted in the past. And in this case, it's like the assumption is that what management wants is they want concessions from you so that they can have more money for themselves, which is fine. You know, it's not ideal, but like there's a couple hundred years of best practices in terms of how you negotiate that. I think that the decision to get rid of a news site right before the beginning of a fucking year long news cycle that promises to be the biggest and most irritating and most widely <laughs> read about in the history of the country is not a business decision. It doesn't 
there's no way in which you can say that that works. If advertisers don't want to have their shit in front of politics, you know, stories, like, to a certain extent, that makes sense. But also, at some point, enough page views make it viable. Mm -hmm. It felt to me like it was just this guy not liking the uh, staff of Splinter. There's a lot of real ardent unionists on that staff. It was hard to parse. But again, this is crazy. This was fucking two weeks ago, too. Yeah. Because it feels like something that happened in like the mid 70s. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> you know, we are all experiencing the time dilation effect oh for God. sure. But then it was like, you know, so so they gave the axe to Splinter and then like, you know, yeah, the the, the two guys here uh, was it uh, Jim Spamfilter and Paul Manafort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah, like the, they, these are like the hatchet men or whatever. Could you, could you speak about like uh, like like their who these guys are and like what their roles were and all of this? So, uh Manafort, of course, everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> the famous ostrich coach. I, yeah, right. I think it's cool that he can work from prison. Like, yeah. I don't agree with what he's doing. The first time but... he showed up at work wearing a suit made out of dolphin skin, and everyone was like, well, <laughs> this is interesting. He, so that guy was a journalist at some point and actually was like a dude that had, uh, which is, you can see now because he's writing a lot of the unbyline blogs that are running on the site, kind which are fire. Yeah, they, which is <laughs> funny because they're like, at the most basic level, like they're competent. It's not like like bar stool level thing where there's like randomly five spaces after every period. And you're like, no one taught you to do that. Like, I don't know where you figured that out. Like, no, but it would be, yeah, it's like, it's like uh, how about that World Series? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. incredible. It's it, Yeah, I, I, I saw some screenshots of it on Twitter and it's like, that's that old dead spin style I love. Where yeah. It's like, uh, when it comes to football, yeah, there's going to be a Super Bowl next yep. year. A winner and a loser. That's always been the way of the game. <laughs> 30 <laughs> yeah right so but, but like that obviously is is not ideal but that guy I, I think was given a terrible mandate by the ceo he, i mean he obviously he made the choice to carry it out and all that but he was so this is the the, the thing that i want to emphasize about all of this that like the ceo is the problem with this company because of the fact that uh he's a fucking maniac and as hack as it is to compare somebody you don't like to Donald Trump, it's the same shit where it's just beefs and like weird, like infighting. And he's constantly, he's turning on people. He's at this point, I think he's like purported to be down on other different people in upper management. He's bringing in his guys who are like, as with Trump, like just otherwise unemployable 61 year old <laughs> men, <laughs> like, which is all like not ideal, obviously, because like they sort of come in and they're like, we're going to do it the way that we did it. Like in, you know, whatever, 2007, like five fucking internets. Ago. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, this became a problem in terms of like the site's user experience and the general experience of being there. But none of this was coming from, the point of it being like, well, like I'm trying to, to make more money for you guys and you got to either like ride with me or, or not. Like the ways in which the sites had become unprofitable were the result of neglect in the previous ownership. A little bit of trimming here and there, literally like turning things like advertising on videos back on, which had inexplicably been turned off. Like seriously, well, it was just like, it was yeah, moldering. Like, so like, um, yeah, like, but like, in, in that, this was like one of the things, like, in recent weeks, where like, like the the tension like really got ratcheted up with like the the, the autoplay video ads yeah. on the site. Like, what happened with that? So this was a like another one of the uh, the business masters that Spanfeller had brought in. Uh, I believe called out a retirement. I'm not exactly sure. Whatever it was, it was like some dude that had sold ads for him it in 2008. Uh, closed. A, <laughs> he, he he sells the ads that pop up on illegal sporting streams, right? Which is basically like, the vibe that yeah, the site yeah. came to take on. Like yeah, it went yeah. from being this like clean Kinja experience to like those weird like pop up like the come play my lord video that <laughs> follows you around the screen and you can't close it. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I love I love Bleacher Report Deadspin. <laughs> <laughs> That's like I mean they're close to literally just doing the Bleacher Report model, just like a 30 part slideshow yeah, where everything's God. a new page of a new audio play video in between every one. So they had like mentioned slideshows at one point to somebody oh, like early God. when he started Holy and they were fuck. like, oh, no, I don't think we're going to do that slideshow about that, but that's cool that you're engaged with our content. And like, in, in this case though, it was like the stuff that, that the video shit was like done with, with an insurance company. It was done basically and, pitched to us as the same sort of deal that places like CNN and ESPN have, which, uh, if you've ever visited either of those sites, it's not Un -usable. a user experience it's that you would want. It's right. absolute dog shit. I had to, I have to upgrade my NVIDIA card to run ESPN. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, like, like uh, the GMG, like, Kinja sites, like, maybe, like, just medium posts, I feel, are the only 
websites other than like Twitter I can lo- read anything on. Right. I, 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 I want to click a news story. I want to read it. And then you go to any news-based website and they make it fucking impossible. And there's a way that sites look when they're dying or when they're struggling like that, which is exactly what you're talking about. That like it's... I think of an example of like all newspaper websites look all like, like this local now. newspaper. Like if you yeah. go, click on like the Miami Herald or like anyone, any newspaper other than the New York Times, it's like you oh, you click on a story, video immediately starts playing. Video like, starts okay, playing. Stop that. Turn on mute. You try to scroll down to find the text. The video follows you. It, it follows. <laughs> I don't want to see this shit. Right. I just want to read it. And the video, the video is always like. What are the best new roller backpacks for traveling this, yeah. <laughs> this or, holiday season? Or like they, they immediately they're like, "Stop! You have an ad blocker on. Yeah, right. turn off the ad yeah. blocker the now. Pol- the police are coming to your house. <laughs> yeah. So this is something that happened with us with like literally getting the like the spam ads that you see if you've ever like illegally streamed a boxing match. Not that you should do that. If you've ever seen any of those ads, it's like the same sort of shit. Where like your flash is out of date, and you're like, I know that that's a lie. I don't trust you. What are you trying to put on well, my no, like, computer? The, the whole the whole like game with that was trying to figure out which of the X's you were presented with actually yeah. closed the window. It's not and the which one, one just that looks like it o- work. opened up like a I don't know a live stream of murders <laughs> from like Malaysia <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Where it's just like immediately FBI on their way to your house. Yeah. So this yeah. was uh yeah. So those those were not uh optimized user experience uh experiences <laughs> what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. So we were having issues with that and like people were writing in and being like, I can't uh, read the site at work or on my phone <laughs> like, and those are two of the places that I like to read it and we would like fo- forward the shit along and just like sort of try to do our best the, a, a complicating factor for me is that I did a lot of video stuff for Deadspin like just like silly stuff that uh, we would do just, like to try to you know whatever they want video we did video it was chill and pleasant and you know I shouldn't have to emphasize this always consensual if you watched any of those videos, it was something that you chose to do. After those ads would play, though, I would be presented on the site so a dozen times a day just in the course of doing my job with my own awful face and voice, <laughs> like talking about baseball players of the early 1990s. And I didn't sign up for that shit in the least in terms of doing these videos. These are for other weirdos to watch as like ASMR. Like if it's like soothing to you to hear me be like, oh yeah, Ron Hassey, <laughs> briefly on the White Sox. Like that's cool. Like, and I love you for that. But like, that's not the sort of thing that I chose to hear um, every time I tried to edit a post or write one. And it's not something that, you know, whatever should have been playing at the same time in a different part of the page as the ad for insurance that was playing in the middle of it. I mean, yeah, that's like, I mean, that's, sort of the story of what happened to everything on the fucking internet you, you just summed it up i mean deadspin was sort of this last bastion because it was like we previously alluded to a lot of weird shit that had no home anywhere else and of course it was amazingly successful because it was one of the few places you would go where the entire website didn't just seize all of your CPU You're right. and go like, here's what you want, dumb fuck. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of the traffic that we had reflected that. Like, people would just literally type the URL into, like, just type deadspin.com and, like, scroll down and read it, which yeah. is, like, kind of sicko behavior in 2019. Like, nobody Whereas does that shit Whereas everyone only reads articles through links in right. you know, yeah. social media. Like, yeah. Which is, it's cool. I mean, in all of that, especially because of the fact that you can scroll down through it and it's not just, like, endless hockey transactions or whatever that there is different shit there's like other stuff there's things in there that aren't necessarily related to sports there's like and not a ton of stuff about like movies or music or culture or whatever but enough that you're at least breaking it up so that you're not just like binging on like free agent gossip right and like so like so so there was the like the autoplay video ads which was like done largely like without the really knowledge or consent of anyone who worked at the site it also wasn't worth very much money as a deal. That's the how other could, part of it. How fucking could it be? Where it's just like, you know, click this balloon to get a free credit score. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so there's the autoplay videos were designed, they were sold to us as a seven figure revenue opportunity, which is to say that if we hit this mark that the guy, our deal master, had carved out with the insurers, then uh, we would receive $1 million. Uh, <laughs> okay. That, that, standard that we needed to hit and the reason why the videos were playing automatically required uh 16 times the number of video exposures that our site was capable of creating like we would have needed to hire 
twice again as many video people as we had. It was beyond not being a good deal. It was like kind of borderline fraudy. Like it well, was. It is. It is borderline fraudy because the only way you could, or like, and the only people who do click on that are like just bewildered old people yeah. interacting with the internet. Like, right. like they're just like. Oh, it's telling me to click here now. I That's think I cool. will. Like, yeah. I'd like to read the story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my dad got a terrible virus on his computer a few, and this is like a thing that he can somehow do despite the fact that he never uses it. He's just like as constantly at war with technology as anyone could be. And I was for a while convinced that he had gotten it from reading one of my stories. <laughs> That he had just like seen something where he was like, well, Davy's site says that like our my flash player isn't working, so I'm gonna download this thing from like Moldova <laughs> and see if that fixes you know the internets that I have in my computer. Run program acid slash burn. Right. <laughs> it's like anything to support my boy. Yeah. <laughs> he got it some other way, but it was like yeah. So the site was was grinding to a halt. All the while there. Uh, sort of leaning on us about this, the idea of like what has been termed like sticking to sports, right, whatever it yeah. is. It's like this tiny fraction of the shit that we do. Basically, like it was not directly targeting Felix's posts, but everything, <laughs> but everything that you've done for us could have been classified. I, I literally like, I just like never did like under 200,000, 250,000 reads. Like it was making money for the place, but they just... Jim Spanfeller hated my post so much he ruined the site. Well, my bad. What later came out is like we were concerned at first. We were like, so, we were like, so what is it? Like, do you want me to stop writing about Donald Trump? Because like, so like, I've there, been there waiting a, for was, someone to ask me to do that for yeah. so long. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out it wasn't that. It wasn't the fucking Joker piece, especially because like your pieces always did big traffic. Mine generally did pretty well. People are saying that um, I actually had the most page views of anyone on the internet. Kind of crazy. That is, yeah. Many people yeah, have no come like to in, me. In, in like the secret like. Uh, in like the um, surveillance proof, like, you know, safe room at the center of One Tree Hill Media. <laughs> they have like on the whiteboard, there's just something called, it says the Felix Paradox <laughs> problem. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like they did. I actually, you know, the CEO of uh, Fios called me like when the <laughs> Joker piece went up and said, they're asking for permission to put more servers the more, online. The more, the most powerful people servers. are reading it. Yeah, I remember but, seeing that picture of you. You looked really upset yeah, on your like, porch. Put them online. I want <laughs> people to read it. <laughs> but uh, but David, like the, the yeah the, the the stick to sports thing. Like this was a was, there was like a, a series of memos that were internally circulated from Jim Spanfilter and Paul Manafort yes. to the company. <laughs> so it was a, it's a Spanfilter initiative okay. uh, that <laughs> was then uh, like delegated to poor Paul uh, Manafort. <laughs> that, uh, the guy's name is not actually the, the, Paul, the, the, Paul Manafort. The, the Jim Spanfeller Human Unreadability Initiative. <laughs> yeah, <it was. laughs> Do you want to know more? Yeah, so the uh, that came down to us finally. Like The way that this all works, so this happened really, really fast. It was We knew that this was something that they were mad about. And we'd periodically hear, again, like, and my apologies for the, the Trump comp again, but there would be rumblings from upstairs like not literally he worked on the same floor as us, but like rumbling part was literal where you'd get mad about some post that went up. There was a video of uh, staffers tasting different yogurts that he was incensed about a three minute video that took an hour to make that he was just sort of like, well, I don't know what this is. First of all, this is not sports when obviously yogurt tasting is a competition. It qualifies as sports. It's stupid. That's just on its face is obviously wrong. Yeah. Tell, tell that to the Macedonian yogurt. Team, right. By please. The way. I dare you yeah. bring it to him. But this, so it was just a guy that had a lot of, of anger issues. And I think also very much wanted us to do what he was saying. And was like, like, and this was sort of couched in a kind of like, uh, you know, management versus staff, like kind of culture clash about the political yeah. thing. But like that was kind of a, a smokescreen for what was really going on. Yeah, there I mean, because the, the like, again, like as apparently... people have pointed out before, like the politics post and the things that were not technically strictly sports, like did extremely well or even outperformed. Because it's like that's the funny thing. It's like, God, where can I go on the internet to just read about sports? Right. Like... This is the part of it that's like that was complicated about the idea of wanting it to be more like every other website. You can see why we would resist that. That like. This was just on principle, the fact that, like, it's not what we want to do. But also, like, yeah. like it's the not why anyone went to Deadspin. Right. Or, place. like, it, that's the, the reason why people went there is that it wasn't just that shit. Because it's, like, there's places that have credentials, that have, like, reporters in locker rooms. We don't have that. Like, we couldn't 
do a lot of the stuff that other places would do. And so we would find the shit that was interesting and show you that, or we would aggregate stuff that people actually worked harder on, and then we would link back to it. It's all like old-timey internet shit. There used to be a lot of sites that were like this. It turned out that like those things dying, I mean, seems now less like a natural death than just sort of like the idea of what they would always say to us was that they wanted like a clean product, that the idea of it, not in the sort of like Dan Ninen sense, but in, the, <laughs> but in the like, that they wanted something that would be easy to explain to people who might someday buy it. Okay. And so that was, as it was explained to us, that that was the, the argument. And what we would say was, you would probably have a better time explaining to someone who wanted to buy our website that we were very successful and that we turned a profit and generated this much traffic despite the fact that our staff is that much smaller than other places, that that would be something that would be easier to sell than uh, it's the same thing as SB Nation, but the user interface is different. And yet like that, it, we said it, it didn't get through. And at some point, like Spanfeller went on vacation he came back on Monday. We got the memo saying that uh, we were to stick to sports and that this was non-negotiable. He had already, Megan had left at this point, hoping that she would basically, who was the yeah, editor in chief, yeah. Megan Greenwell, it, it, a hero. In, it, specifically in pro, like before, like everyone else left. This was like yeah, in protest. So she of, left in August after Spanfeller basically made clear that he was going to make things really bad for her because of an investigative story that one of our writers had done about uh, the media group that had purchased this. Right. That Laura Wagner did. And Megan basically hoped that because Spanfeller so hated like you, her so you, much, she would leave. You published an investigative piece on the people who bought you. Yeah, that which made is... Them, I mean, that is like... I mean, it's something you're nose at them, but like, come on, like... No, it, yeah. for sure it is. And it's also... I mean, it was done fairly. Like, yeah. they were given an opportunity to answer questions. It's kind of the thing when you buy the Gawker sites, you got to deal with the annoying stuff about Gawker too, which is fine. You're buying it because the sites make money, like you're not buying it because it's like going to flatter right. you or I be mean, fun. Like the, the, the point is that the reason they make money is because like they do stuff like that. Yes. And, and also the fact that like that in itself is like the thing that makes readers trust us, that this is like that basically like that, that transparency as like sort of showboaty as it might've seemed at times in the past when everybody's like saying who they're going to vote for in the election, like old timey Gawker stuff that basically like in doing that post, like I think that, it communicates to the readers that we are going to be straight with them about what we're doing, that they should know what it is that they're consuming. And if we're not telling them to go away. The idea of, or that we're telling it to antagonize the powerful people in charge. The idea is that like the relationship that we had with the readers is where the value of the sites is. It's why people came to them. It's why people cared about it when it was gone. So and then after uh, Megan left, is that when Barry took over? Barry took over as the acting editor-in-chief, and they began a long process of interviewing people that uh, obviously is still ongoing to find uh, the next editor-in-chief. They got some good candidates. Um, they got some, then they put some recruiters on it, and they asked some less uh, good candidates. And whatever it was, they were casting a wide net. Uh, they were just continuing to sort of have people back for endless rounds of it. I have no idea how close they were to actually hiring one by the time that uh, Barry left. Barry is the greatest blogger in the history of Deadspin, like had some really good shit on the website by 10 in the morning every single day for 11 years or however long he was there. Um, and everybody respected him. The idea that he was fired by Spanfeller because of our sort of unwillingness to go along with the sticking to sports stuff, which we did basically just through putting up some like silly posts that were not the most related to sports. And this was like the like the, the final like week of dead spin. It was this like is, you had the you had the piece about Trump being booed at the World Series. Yeah. And then every other piece that day was about like wedding dresses to buy. Yeah. And like, yeah. And like yeah. yeah, like but I mean we found it, it <laughs> like, was we here, found ways to make it annoying here's in a picture less of a dog. Like, yeah. <laughs> like pictures of dogs that Tom Lay saw in Mexico. Uh Dom Cosentino <laughs> breaking down tape of a bear that showed up like wandering through a motel in Tennessee. <laughs> and he was like, you know, like like good center of gravity, not much burst. Like he did his best to make it sound like football. He like it was an honorable effort. But yeah, so we got a few of those posts up that day. Uh, Barry got called in. Uh, Spanfeller told him to get the fuck out, um, at which point we were now down two editors-in-chief in three months. And at this point, it, it just sort of became clear that whatever it was that we could do to go along with this, like there was not going to be a getting back to normal. Too many people were leaving. They weren't being replaced. And it was clear that you know the issue was that if we made it through this tantrum, and sort of just 
ate shit and tried our best to do blogs, like we would continue to have our jobs, but we would also be at the mercy of the next tantrum. That there is no sense that this was ever going to get better or change. There was a sense that it could die down before blowing back up again. Yeah, and like, and so like, yeah, the rest is history. Like, you know, a dead spin, as you know, everyone you know knows it is is gone. It's it's no more. I mean, like, it's it's like it's corpses. Like, you know, technically you can still visit the website, yeah, but they're cross posting stuff from other GMG sites just to fill it out while they, I guess, try to. I mean, they I did kind of feel bad for that one guy who like, oh, that, yeah, there was like some a, dude that just, who like, just like oh, cold yeah. emailed them and was yeah. just like, hey, I'd love to write for you. So and that like, piece was apparently assigned by HR, which is incredible. <laughs> oh, Classic editorial goodness. best practices stuff. So that's like, again, forbidden mind realms untold for all of these <laughs> processes. Like none of this has ever happened before. This was just some dude that like had some silly thing. He pitched it. He didn't get even a quote on what he was going to get for it. And then, yeah, and then he got fucking dragged to hell by people calling him a scab, which was like, you know, it's not technically wrong, but I do feel I feel bad for him because I don't think he, he really understood what he was getting into. Yeah, he got a handsome uh, 30,000 deadspin credits yeah, <laughs> that could be spent on new video experiences. Yep. Uh, it's, it's like it, it, this entire thing. I don't know. It, it, again, it speaks to something broader that's happening in all media, which is you're really not allowed to have something that's like in the sort of in the middle class of popularity or in a niche anymore. Right. Everything has to be geared to be the biggest thing for absolutely everyone. Which is strange too, because journalism is not a field where you're going to make money like that. Media in general, even including like movies and television is not necessarily a field where you're going to make money. Yeah. Well, you guys really lost the lottery in, in the sense that, um, you got the private equity guy who's so stupid that he did private equity on journalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is not, they're not sending their best. <laughs> yeah. But this was also like the sort of thing where they weren't even doing private equity on journalism. Well, yeah. Right. Like, well, like this was, if you, if you want to just like ring us, ring profit out of the website and the traffic that it generates, like you do that right up to the point where people stop leaving, not past that point. And then you do it and you fucking sell it to someone who wants to own it. It's not that hard. Right. If you if you wanted to be totally amoral and do it right, you would let Deadspin do the exact same content they've been doing, but up the intrusive ad experience and probably fuck over people's benefits. Right. Like, that's the model for it. But this, I, I he, Jim Spam Filter really confuses me. Yeah. Well, for, is, first, he has, like, he has a lovely Bob haircut that I've he's noticed. Incredible. <laughs> he's incredible. It's, like a, a, it's like a Bob. Lego man hair. Like, it just is, like, it snaps under a little <laughs> knob on the top of his head. <laughs> I was thinking it's more like a flapper haircut. <laughs> it's a very strange hair choice for a man of his age. But uh, he, yeah, I mean, like, when you guys got purchased, yeah, I thought, like, oh, well, they're just going to, like, you know, data harvest more than companies than like you know the geo media already does and they'll probably be like some autoplay shit and the like people's contracts will be fucked with a little bit but like this guy really came in there and was like why don't we do a slideshow that's like the 30 coolest quarterbacks yeah it's, it's incredible it's baffling i feel so fucking naive about this because i think that's exactly right but i remember the first like all hands that he had like there's like a country like a company history of like super shitty all hands where like everyone's sitting like there's like a role of editors in the front. They're all like aggressively vaping at the guy while he talks. <laughs> like it's a confrontational culture, like in some ways. But he came up there and he was like, he's kind of corny, but like, it, you know, also like I'm kind of corny at this point. Like he was like sort of dressed like me, which I didn't appreciate at the first one. Like, <laughs> so he's up there like, and you know, he, he didn't really seem to know or care very much about the sites, which in retrospect was the issue that he was just like, he's, he's wearing one of your, uh, your trademark, uh, David Roth flannel. Yeah. And right. He, like, and, and when he stands like, next to you, it looks like a magic eye. Yeah, poster everybody was like mad at him, but I was like, it's a solid plaid. Let's give him a chance. And it was, but he, you know, he's talking about the sites. He doesn't know much. He's like, I'm going to get up to speed on it. That's not a thing that he did. But the rest of it where he was like, yeah, there's more money to be made in these sites and I want to make it like at some point, like it didn't, I didn't want to fucking party with the guy or anything, but I was like, all right, good, do it. Like, that's what we want. Like, make the sites more valuable and more stable and make our lives easier. Share the portion of it with us that the union contract compels you to share. And like, let's all get on with our lives. Like, I'll see you at the Christmas party. And um, he just couldn't fucking do it. Like, he couldn't stop messing with stuff. Well, I mean, that's what I think, like I said, like whether it's like Deadspin or just like 
all media in general, which is like, especially like, you know, news of any kind, uh, it was in very dire straits and is increasingly, you know, turning to more, like more and more venal and corrupt yeah. sources of money to, yeah, like to be profitable or get clicks or hits or whatever. But I think like the point that has to be stressed here is at the end of the day, like this really wasn't about money because yeah. like Deadspin was like a very successful site. Like I think like this idea that like, oh, it's just all about like that, you know, like these writers are like this, this is like a vanity project. And like in the real world, you know, you just got to like you got to make hard choices. And, yeah. And, you know, like, you know, buckle down a little bit. But like, like really like that's not the case. Like, I mean, like the, the it was more about like not about like money, but like their like their control and their kind of like like all like like an entire class of people like political or otherwise are just like their pissiness about the, being, like, being rude or too, smart yeah. yeah being like the smart people are being like rude or pissy to the wrong kind of people and like that's really I think the rock in their shoe about yeah. all of this mm-hmm. that's the part of it that I can't I can't speak for everybody on the staff but for me a sort of a a moment when I realized it obviously like you don't get to to pick your owners and you don't uh, there's plenty of sites successful websites that are owned by cretinous people that don't read or don't care about the stuff that's on the website and if they only cared about money then you know like it's possible to have a relationship a symbiotic healthy relationship with an owner like that that works in this case it was about i think not the politics of what we were doing but about sort of and and not even about how annoying we you know inherently were as people at this website i think that there's this sense among rich people that journalists are class enemies and that fundamentally you don't owe them anything that like you're not just even if they're making you money even if they are both like the product and the labor of the that of the thing that you sell that like fundamentally like the most important thing is making sure that they don't get over on you, that they don't win anything. <laughs> Which is weird because we talk about like, you know, class solidarity among like the elites and the ruling class. And like, it's just uh, another example of their own incompetence because I mean, if they were smarter, they'd realize that journalists are their like most sacred class allies in yeah. their actual function in our society. Right. I mean, that's the part of <laughs> yeah. it. That, yeah. It's crazy that way. I mean, just, I think it brings home how like sort of not just like pissy, they are obviously very pissy, but like, just how like actually mediocre and often dumb these people are like the idea that like like Trump's issue with the media is not anything beyond the fact that they periodically make him look bad yeah like it's not this he doesn't have like a nuanced idea of like whatever the fucking third state is supposed <laughs> to do or anything like that that this is all like the sense of did I get the number of a state right it's the fourth, 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 fourth state, state. Yeah, yeah. it's the third estate the peasantry of, of uh, ancien regime France yeah <laughs> Trump has passionate deeply held opinions yeah. about <laughs> ancien regime France but not about journalism but he's like, got some very tall and handsome sans culottes <laughs> 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 Guildsman come up to me crying. <laughs> Jean, yes. Valjean, Jean Valjean, what a great voice! <laughs> but yeah, like all, all Inspector all Javert, a, a great blue life. <laughs> <laughs> Standing behind him with like a weird, like a David Clark hat on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some press conference. Giving him a giant medal before he jumps off the, jumps into the river Seine to kill himself. <laughs> but I think it's like, it's, it's more like the idea that like um, writing of any kind is harder and harder to make money doing it. And like, if you are doing it within the confines of like an organization or a company or an institution, the people that own that or put up the cap, like the capital behind it, they know that the writers think that they're smarter than everyone else. Yep. You know, for better. Yeah, or worse. I mean, fair enough. Like, fair enough. Sit here and pretend that that's not. But true, like, but... I think I think what it comes down to is that like they they feel that like because they are the capital, they're, like they they are their like. They are the betters. Yeah. And like the, the people beneath them like need to understand that. And that's just the thing that Megan wrote, which I think on her departure, which I recommend everybody and uh, I think is like really the last word on, on what we're dealing with here called the adults in the room is it's about that sort of condescension towards people that that have less. And I, this was the thing that I think animated all of the Spanfeller period at the these companies. He came in and just sort of like systematically pushed out not just like journalist people but people that did revenue people that like were administrators just because like for i mean for one thing they were there before so like they must have been asshole idiots or why weren't they working at some other company but then also i mean just because he had this this idea in his head that like because of the fact that these people were holdovers they couldn't possibly understand the things that he understood or do the stuff that he wanted to do the other point that megan makes in that piece that i want to emphasize is that like 
it is difficult to make money in media. It is not impossible to make regular, decent profits in media. Like sustainable business stuff absolutely can be done, even on the internet, even with the capture of online advertising by this duopoly of Facebook and Google. It can be done. It can't be done, like Felix said, at these fucking like bizarre 10x ideas where they think that like somehow Deadspin is going to become Uber because <laughs> like it has enough advertisements on it. But even Uber isn't really a fucking legit 10x thing, too. That like this is what they what they've come to expect is that you get a winning lottery ticket one time in three, and that's just not the way that it goes. And the idea of owning a business that makes a steady profit is somehow like for poorer people to do. Like it's just not yeah. like a goal that they see as worth pursuing. Well, yeah, private equity is the it's you know hopefully if we get out of whatever we're in now and people in the future look back at this time they'll be amazed that we allowed this to be legal for as long as we it's did incredible they all of it is but man you can own a business without really having any any skin in it you can just run it into the fucking ground nothing will matter people will give you money after you can do it to the next place because like you said hey maybe the next one we just buy out and fucking ruin we do it right this time you don't actually know anything about these businesses. You don't know anything about how it works. It's legal for you to just fucking rip these places apart, redo contracts, fuck over people who've been there forever. Uh, if you don't fundamentally understand why whatever place you bought, whether it's a media concern, whether it's a whether it's a company, Toys R Us or yeah, whatever, Toys yeah, R Us, right. you don't understand why it makes money. Hey, who cares? You'll get the next run, one right. Like, in fact, like the people that gave you money to do this. They can just write this off. You created a loss to them. They're happy to do it again if on the next time you make some sort of you know 500% return in a five-year period by just making life miserable for everyone who works for this company or anyone who buys anything from it. That's the part of it that's so disheartening about all of it is that like it doesn't at some point matter if you get it right. That like it doesn't the idea of these that you pay yourself either way, that you right. can run up this debt on this company crash it into the ground in the way that you did with Toys R Us, which was like a profitable concern in every way, except for the fact that the private equity people that ran it borrowed so heavily against it. You know, you get your management fees. When the thing goes bankrupt, you're fine. And then it's like, it almost doesn't matter if you do it right. That like, it seems almost at this point as if that's no longer the point. That the idea of like owning something or keeping it is like for suckers or for small timers. That that's like for people that have like a bunch of Subway franchises. You know, that like, and it's, it's strange too, because I think of like, we talked a lot. I mean, I, even just in the few times that I've been on here about like this, I like small business fascists, like the yeah, backbone of tyrant. like, of like what's wrong with like our political culture at the moment. I think that a lot of venture people are at a different, I know that, that Spanfeller himself, as far as I know, is not politically conservative. He's not a Republican, that this is like, that this level of like sort of zipless consequence free wealth is like those people can be elite democrats they can have enlightened political opinions in like the most baseline like just sort of like standard liberal ways and yet like because of the fact that this is all unreal to them because of the fact that the companies that they own don't matter because of the fact that the people that are involved in it are like you know theoretically could do some sort of like <laughs> means tested retraining course and get back on you know on the job or whatever that all of that is like it's at this level of abstraction where sort of anything any outcome feels possible because like all the the stuff that's supposed to make sense the idea of like making the company profitable and then harvesting those profits as capitalists have for hundreds of years seems somehow to be like no longer state of the art it's i mean private equity is something that can only exist in a diseased world absolutely it's true. a it's an absolutely fucking diseased way of thinking that this is it's just acceptable that you're going to have a certain you're going to fail a certain amount of times and your failure rate it means nothing for you it means nothing for your investors it means nothing for your creditors they can the creditors are going to get their money back the investors they get a write off or they just are made whole again that that percentage of failure that is acceptable when you run your numbers is just destroying people's lives and for what like at, at no point at no point does anyone who who does private they don't ever seem to learn the business better than the people who did it before they purchased yeah, the company yeah that's not part of how that, they understand yeah. their job you know and and, and it, people 
like McKinsey consultants come in, people like Mayor Pete come in <laughs> yeah. and tell them how to rework contracts to pay people less. And I mean, not just the fact that this exists, but the fact that it does and we're all just like, ah, that's life. These yeah. guys can just literally borrow tens of billions and, you know, best absolute best case scenario, just make life like 30% shittier for about, you know, 10,000 employees that's the best case that we're all just like oh yeah that's part of yeah. it's part of the finance economy it is it's absolutely disease and you know like as as you pointed out like look anyone who has a job or like exists in any kind of institution like you know in a capitalist economy blah 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 like you know we no one's hands are really clean but like it is possible to like make money yeah or like run a profitable concern and you know what you're about of you know like the market sucks but like it has rules yeah. everybody knows what they and, are like, you know, like, and it's just this thing, like, whenever I hear about, like, oh, like, you know, Twitter is in trouble, like, you know, how can they possibly do it? You know, how can a, how can a website that's used by 30 million people possibly make money? You know, because it's just like, because it's not about that, because they've signed on to this, like, the people who have invested way too much money in it, in it have, like, it's pinged to this, like, infinite excessive growth. Right. It's just like... Nothing is ever enough. And you can see this with like the sites that are actually considered to be successful, the like four or five concerns that everybody's like, well, Amazon, everybody can agree on that yep. shit. Like the end game for those sites is to become the entire internet. Yeah. That's what Facebook yeah. wants. Amazon wants to replace all retail. Like that is not the, uh, that's not like healthy growth or competition in any meaningful way. It's just like the end game of inequality is like somehow just like a totalizing version of capitalism that doesn't have room for smallholders for anybody except for the people like that are, have the absolute commanding heights. And you know, like, and like I said at the beginning, like this example of Deadspin, which was like, you know, a fun website that, that we enjoyed and yeah, we had some personal connection to. To get from like, there to totalizing capital, yeah, but you know, like, I, like, you know, it's, not, it, it's like, again, like it's not the, the, the worst outrage we ever talked about on the show, but like people have lost their jobs. It sucks. But like overall, like, like it's an example of Felix, what you're talking about earlier, like whether it's like culturally or otherwise, what we see happening is just this like great flattening of like anything that has any possibility to be even slightly interesting or different into this like mass homogenization of like where everything has to be it, everything has to appeal to everyone and the net result of that is always just like just like the stupefaction of like everything where yeah. it's just like the dumbing down and flattening of anything and like the removal of any possibility for anything new or different to happen we yeah, and we saw it. We've seen this like this is the final conclusion of the media cycle of the past few years. Like we saw in 2013, 2014, places started like paying people to do like horribly exploitive first person essays about like every bad thing that had ever happened to them, and they go, yeah, here's two hundred and fifty dollars to talk about the worst fucking moment of your life. It went from that, you know, they ran out of those stories, so it just became. All right, just write something that people will hate. We're not going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to yeah, tell yeah. you that's why you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, yeah, you're a fucking scared shitless 22 year old with a useless fucking journalism degree. You can't get a job anywhere else. So, like, why don't you write an article like saying that coming to America is canceled? <laughs> yeah. And so, like, yeah, so like Donald Trump Jr. can get like his once a month like successful tweet making fun of it, but yeah. people will click on it and you'll make like, nine hundred and seventy dollars for the website and as that winds down we just go into the bleacher reportification of everything where they've exhausted all other options they sort of the few places that did anything that had any like natural audience a natural group of people that enjoyed it they've been fucking driven away because you drove away the people that did that and you drove away the ethos that made people feel like they were in a place that wasn't like anywhere else so your only destination is this. Just the fucking flat affect of this time. So this I've is said it before, like, no one's going to remember being alive now. And they're not going to remember it because everything, everything we did in our free time, everything we ostensibly did for fun was the fucking same. Nothing feels memorable at all. <laughs> And that's not just that's not just like getting older and feeling like you've determined the formula for all entertainment or, or anything else. It's that everything is so financialized and churned into an algorithm that, yeah, why would anything be that different from it, it itself? I think why? there's that narrowing that you're talking about, I think is really, it's hard to be positive about the experience. I mean, obviously I'm very happy to have worked at Deadspin. I'm happy to have met the people like, but the thing that I can say 
that I feel optimistic about in all of this is that what you're describing sucks ass and everybody knows it. I think that people hate it and I think that you can feel a certain, there's a certain clamminess and desperation to, especially, I was thinking about this today about Bob Iger getting, like picking a fight with Martin Scorsese because he doesn't <laughs> like MCU movies. And that like, to me, but like- also doing it in explicitly like, uh, like you're racist if you don't like yeah, Black Panther. Right, like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm sorry that, that you can't understand how beautiful this story is. Yeah. That like whatever we made specifically so that somebody like who speaks no language that lives in like Western China would pay to watch it. <laughs> that like all of it to me is like, that's not, I don't think that Bob Iger thinks very deeply about any of this stuff. I think he has to know that a world where there are 20 movies a year going to theaters and they're all based on previously existing inter like intellectual property or whatever is like sooner or later people are going to be like, well, this actually blows to me that like some people will not some people that's all they want. And certainly for Bob Iger's purposes, those movies are all fantastically profitable. So why not? But that's not the way that any of this works because there's people in, you know, as the inputs and outputs and all of this that like, I think that everybody is demanding a little bit more out of life than our culture and our life and our media is currently affording to us. Well, speaking this of... Is, this isn't like... And it's not like... I hope you're right. I do... I don't know. I may be in a bit of a bubble of like people who just have consumed so much that they're coming to this conclusion very quickly. But it is... You know, this is one of those things that wouldn't be revolutionary, but it would be like... It's like everything else. The things that people actually want and are branded as revolutionary aren't things that would totally upend the system. They wouldn't make guys like Jim Spanfeller not rich anymore, but it would at least remove the boot from the neck if you didn't go bankrupt for going to the hospital, if you didn't just fucking sort of passively drift into suicidal ideation every time you watch TV because yeah. it's all the fucking same shit and you feel like there's no future because you've seen everything. You know exactly what's coming next. But, you know, I no, I do hope you're right. I do. I hope that everyone starts to realize we've all been slurping the same shit out of the same toilet for about a fucking decade. Uh, to take it a slightly different direction. I mean, speak, <laughs> speak, speaking of uh, uh, people who expect nothing out of life and get no pleasure out of it whatsoever. One of the interesting things about uh, this saga is the way how quickly it has been conscripted into a kind of... Uh, uh, a culture war uh, point scoring, uh, specifically because, you know, like Deadspin was associated with, you know, uh, smart urban people, basically. Yeah. And I have seen a lot of crowing from the likes of people like Ben Dominich to be like, you know, uh, surprise, surprise. Like, you know, you have to have, if you run a website, you got to have something that people want to read. My God. Or like, <laughs> or all the, the barstool Neanderthals or whatever. Just being like, uh, come work for me. Yeah, you shouldn't have tried to do something that didn't <laughs> suck. That's <laughs> yeah, your yeah. first mistake, bitch. And, uh, yeah. and again, a hilarious coming from Ben Dominich, who is the EIC of the Federalist. I legitimately, I myself, the post that I write in a month do more traffic than Ben than the Federalist but, does. You know what? Yeah. The not only does this is literally is literally only online due to inefficiencies in the tax code. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's it. That's fucking it. See, that to me is the part of it that that's frustrating. I mean, like I'm fucking grown, man. I can't have room for bar stool in my life. Like I just <laughs> like I wish all of those those guys the best on their series sevens or whatever. Like all the fucking <laughs> dudes. Like, but it's not like. And then you know whatever they're, they're. No, I think it's good to have like a make work program for people that would otherwise. Yeah, be, people that like, well, yeah. It was, it was part people of, that say <laughs> things like I thought about being a cop. Like people that say <laughs> yeah, like that yeah. class was, of yeah. dude. No, it was like part of it was a like New Deal program for Boston. <laughs> <laughs> But the like the certainly the like the conservative element of it or these like whatever like people with uh like peculiar anime logos coming in and like telling me to code or whatever right, right. that like shit like that is like Oh, you just got memed on. I You're did. a cuck. <laughs> it was like by sharing with me the, the one joke that their culture has, yeah. like they're repeating it back and forth. Yeah. But all of that stuff I mean, for sure the idea of like some like fucking like welfare queen like Ben Domina. She's just yeah. basically like some still unknown rich dude is just basically like floating his shitty enterprise that nobody cares about because it's like important to have more garbage out there in the world. That like that model is like that's one of the two that works. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> like yeah, yeah, and that yeah. works very specifically because the people who fund it explicitly understand that these concerns will never make any money. Right. Ever. And so that they are essentially 
like ninety percent of conservative media outside of like the like you know the big like Fox News or like talk radio yeah. or shit, which is a lot of it. But like I'm talking about like the the vanity concerns are all totally insulated from anything that would even remotely the supposedly resemble. like August stuff yeah. where they're like, well, the National Review, a home of the, like a last outcast of like like formal thought. Yeah, it's still the same thing. It's just some fucking rich guy like writing something off to a foundation. Right. As long as you never surprise them by saying something that might bother them, like Ben Dominich will die employed decades hence and not only that but like he's a he guy who works in journalism who has failed up after being fired for plagiarism like twice or something yeah. like that well how bad i mean the only thing that could get him oh, fired no, from his sorry. job I was is if, of benny johnson yeah but i mean benny's ridiculous too because that guy i don't think really believes in anything and yet has like eagerly gone fash like that's just like that was never a like a negotiable thing to him like if it's like that's what it takes to go down to like the next like place that'll have him he'll like sure yeah he'll fucking like absolutely like do the nay nay while donald trump talks about brown hordes on a video <laughs> behind him like that's not like a, a difficult point for him right. benny johnson is he's a fascinating case you know maybe he'll be taught in like advanced courses years from now a pure freak like a, the, a golden man in some sense that he just he's literally only in this because he's a fucking freak who loves making content yeah, that's the only thing he actually enjoys is when he makes like a gifable moment of him like doing the shoot dance in front of, in front of like a cop who heroically shot like five unarmed yeah, people. He's responsible for what is, to my mind, the single most chilling bit of content ever to appear on the internet. Have you seen the when he went to Fort Hood yes. after the shooting? Yes. So to me, that is like for those who have not. He was still at BuzzFeed at the time, uh, had not yet been fired for being a, a plagiarism happy psychopath. And they sent him down there after uh, this catastrophic act of violence on a military base. And he went there and just straight up photographed the Arby's on the base and was like, they have an Arby's just like us. <laughs> like, and then like a photograph of the soda fountain inside where he's like different selections. It was absolutely sociopathic like disconnection from any of the stuff that he was doing. It was basically just like, these guys are normal. This base is beautiful. Not anything about the shooting, not anything about what the people on the base, because there was no people spoken to in the entire story. Like it was just a man whose mind is completely like brands and signifiers. Yeah. If you open, like if you did an MRI on Benny Johnson, that brain is just filled with candy. Yeah. It's just a fucking bowl on Halloween. I guess like I I can't let you I can't let you go, David, without talking, you know, about the cross section, you know, the crossover between sports and politics. It's very oh, specifically do we dare? about Donald Trump's appearance at sporting events. You know, your last one the piece for I think for Deadspin famously <laughs> was him being booed at the World Series. Yeah. And you know, and you know, it is okay to boo a president and chant lock him up when he shows his face at a baseball game. Especially when he's never shown his face in front of people that could conceivably have booed him in the past. And like, everything that he does is, like, a fucking convention center in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and you have to take, like, a loyalty oath to get in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what I loved about that is, like, him showing up at the Nationals in, like, in D.C. and being booed by a stadium full of people um, is that, like, you know, immediately, like, uh, his defenders could immediately say, this is D.C. These are swamp-style sports yeah. fans. There, it was one hundred. <laughs> Benny tweeted that it was one hundred percent lobbyists <laughs> and uh, and bureaucrats in the crowd. Um, which you know, I guess you could maybe make that stretch if it's a Nationals game. Just the other day, uh, yeah. he showed up at the UFC fight in Madison Square Garden and was booed again by a stadium full of people. Which that I is love the, because. That UFC as I think maybe second to NASCAR in terms of like the shithead sport of America. So it's a little harder to make the uh, argument that it is only the uh, swamp style elites uh, yeah. booing you. One hundred percent bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the UFC should be like that is a pretty bad sign for him because the UFC is his exact base. It's you know UFC, it's, tickets to the UFC are very expensive, like for good seats, and like actually going there arduous it's his exact base it's like people who make a really good living who affect a sort of blue collar like bullshit affect and if he like can't get a good pop there that's fucking that's super so not good for he him. announced today like this is i think this is going to be an no, interesting this, yeah, trend yeah. his like ongoing search for a sporting event where he won't get told to like <laughs> so, eat dicks until he, he dies okay, so they, they, just, really, they just announced 
after the USC, right on the heels of the National World Series, and then USC again, Madison Square Garden, it's the heart of Manhattan. Again, swamp style human beings. This is deep state people. Um, he just announced that he will be attending an LSU Alabama football yep. game. And if he can't get a pop in that audience, right. then honestly, I'm you know I'm betting heavily against him in 2020. It's hard to know where else you go after that. Like if those the, student sections can come through on this, like he just I think. Like, I don't know where, like, you could possibly, you'd have to go, like, door to door at the, um, what's that fucking giant retirement community in Orlando? The villages. The villages, yeah. Like, you could go to, like, a pickleball tournament in the villages, <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, we love you, sir. Thanks for, like, standing up for our yes. cops. The only, like, major event he could go to is, like, I guess, like, one of those places in India where there's just, like, all those B- BJP people who, like, worship Donald Trump playing cricket against <laughs> That's, each other. That's, like, the only, like, mass event he could go to because, yeah, if you, I mean, maybe college football because those are people who just, like, go to different, like, their night out at age 60 is to, like, go to different neighborhoods and call the cops on, like, <laughs> suspicious people, like, trying it out in new locales. But... I had like yeah. a list in my head of like venues that he could go to and either get owned at or like possibly not. Like I think like an uh like a Phoenix Coyotes NHL game. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'd probably do okay there. Yeah. But like, you know, you never can tell. Like I think he's he's doing a pretty bad job. It's like most people think this. He just somehow has managed to keep himself insulated from uh that experience. But also the dude that like got knocked out in the main event at the UFC thing was like a real vocal pro Trump guy. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And he got knocked out, knocked out by a Bernard brother. Yeah, yes. yeah, by Kevin, Kevin Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee's sick. Yeah. <laughs> what and, was the uh, Instagram? It was like Bernie Sanders, you bastard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kevin Lee, yeah. I did not know that Kevin Lee was a was a Bernie bro, but no, Kevin Lee is a fucking sick fighter too. He's fun to watch. Oh, uh, but I think as you were saying earlier, uh actually Bernard should start going to UFC events. No, well, he needs, like, the opposition that he's going to face, he needs, like, an army of guys from Ohio and Western PA. Like, <laughs> yeah. he needs, like, guys who have traumatic brain injuries and emotional trauma from being forced to wrestle since they were four years old. <laughs> Permanent cauliflower ears, can't wear, like, earbud headphones. Just those types of guys. Like, that's his... That should be his army. The the uh, Stipe Miocic dads, yeah. or whatever you say his name. Yeah, Stipe Miocic. Yeah. Like, it should, right, it should just be guys named Brendan Brandon. <laughs> who <laughs> protect him. Every, like, those, because those are the, those are the American Dakistanis, Ohioans and Western Pennsylvanians. <laughs> they're, no, they're terrifying. Or, or just someone who has honor tattooed on their back or exactly. something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bernie could, like, if he gets those guys, and I think he could. Unstop- he would be no. unstoppable. He would, yeah, like any parking lot in America, he's the safest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, he's, I think he could do it. I think he could appeal to them. He might already. I don't know. I think like, he kind of does. And that's yeah. like the thing that, that sets him apart is that like, because what you're describing is like, there's nobody that's more of a non-voter than the dude you just described. Yeah. And yet like, that's the people where they sort of were like, they don't think that he's bullshit. Yeah, which is like a good place to start, you know, for a politician, because I don't think there's really anybody else that like could lay claim to that. And yeah, he puts things in these terms that like appeals to like non-voting Americans or it's just like his message is just straight straight up being like, no, it's it's bullshit that you like you can't see a doctor. And And by non-voting Americans, we're talking about at least as far as the last presidential election goes. A hundred million people. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so, like, which is probably easier than trying to like persuade somebody that's like whatever that voted for someone that they knew was a sex criminal because they yeah. wanted a tax cut not to do that a second time. Yeah. You know, but like the flat brim guard. Like if we get Bernie his flat brim guard, like no, I don't care, you know, heart attack gun, poison darts. No, they're stopping all of it. Absolutely <laughs> like no, no, I like his chances. Well, um, we should uh, we should wrap things up for today. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you to David Roth. Um, thank you again to you, everyone who worked at Deadspin, and best of luck to you guys in the future. But one minor caveat, if you listen to this episode or already follow us on Twitter, uh, please stop asking us to finance the new Deadspin or media project because... I, a, it's way more money than you think it is. It's B, so like, much more money than you think it is, man. Way, <laughs> way too incompetent. Yeah. So, like, I, this I, is I know, literally I be, the only job we could do. <laughs> I, know. I know. I know. People want to like put their hope in like you know like a, a new like independent model that's that's free from all this bullshit. But 
please don't put your hopes in us doing two episodes a week is just about the <laughs> limits no, of our capabilities. I will, I will, if someone who's like has made their bed once as an adult <laughs> wants to put this together, like put together a new great dead spin, I would, I would scab, I would write for free to get you guys engagement, but no, I would I would run it worse than Jim Spanfeller if we did this. I think this I'm is, being honest. This is kind of like the dark part about all this. Like, I mean, I say that it's easy to run this stuff at a profit, but also like I arrived 45 minutes late for a podcast on my first day of unemployment. So like maybe like keep looking, find another guy. Yeah, if you if you're out there and you have like a good sense of morality and you know like what a good website is when you see it and also like you know, you, you the only time you've woken up at three o'clock as an adult is with a violent sickness, <laughs> like with a horrible illness caused you to do that. You know, get in contact. Otherwise, we are so not your huckleberry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's a nice thought, though, and I yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah. No. Um, well, that does it for us uh, this week. Again, thanks again to David Roth. Thank yeah. you for having uh, me. Deadspin.